and I came back in uh, accused of uh, killing a guy called Kenneth Lanahan, who was a member of the EVF in Donegal Pass, and shooting three of his uh, uh, his companions or his colleagues. I don't find it hard to admit. No, I, I was a bigot. It's 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 hard or as easy to admit that I was an IRA gunman, that I was an IRA killer. I mean, Freddie's Cabotici got me over to the strand, and the safe house came over, briefed me, told me what to expect, then came around later to another safe house, got me off to the dock. Uh, uh, but I end up getting caught. I know the night that they captured me, the first night they said, uh, oh, we've got the gunman. Anthony, you're very welcome to the No Edit podcast. Delighted to be here and grateful for the opportunity. The first question I'm going to ask you as a lifelong Republican is your thoughts on the United Ireland. Any closer, any further? Well, as a 19th century art critic used to say of Berlin, it's always in the process of becoming and never in the state of being. And this seems very much the same to me in relation to a United Ireland. I, I don't think we're, we're certainly no closer as a result of anything the IRA did. If we are, it's as a result of the instability created uh, by Brexit. But at the end of the day, I think that the consent principle uh, as applied in the North is not going to be, uh, not going to result in a majority of people for the long-term foreseeable future that's going to change the constitutional position. I have stated for many years that no one who was ever in the provisional IRA uh, will ever live to see United Ireland. No one who fought in the ranks of the provisional IRA will ever live to see what they fought for. Do you find that hard to say, Anthony? Because at one time you were in the provisional IRA and I'm sure you believed that you would see a United Ireland in your lifetime. Well, I did believe I would see a United Ireland in my lifetime. I mean, who would get on a rocket to go to the moon if they were told they were never going to reach it? That somebody would reach, then somebody's, one of your children conceived and born in the moon might reach it, but I wouldn't get on that rocket. I look at, uh, back at the situation and, and I don't, it's easy for me to say actually because I, I, I'm trying to describe it uh, for what it is. There's no, it's not joyful for me to say, but at the same time, it's not sad. I think it's a, a fact that I have just come to terms with uh, over the years. And uh, I mean, I have certain views on the IRA's war that I didn't have at the time I was part of it. And so the the, the absence of a united Ireland uh, or the uh, unviability of united Ireland in the, the, the near future doesn't really annoy me. I think the older you get, the, 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 the emphasis in life changes. And uh, I, when I look at my children and stuff I, and uh, I look at the young population, I, I'm tempted to always ask, them, well, I do ask the question, it's not that I'm tempted. And that, 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 that question is, I mean, what would we prefer uh, to be under British rule with the state of the world National Health Service or to be under Irish rule where we died like mid, uh, medieval peasants because we had no health service. The answer is quite simple. I prefer to be under British rule. It's about what's good for people. Uh, I mean, I think as uh, Owen McNeil, not a popular figure in Republicanism, once said, there's, there's no casting the Houlihan or he's calling us, it's a ghost. You know, the, the real people, real world, will have to do real things. So what is your thoughts on Brexit? Anthony, I mean, many people, when this all started, um, had visioned that this was the way it was going to go, that it would weaken the union. What were your thoughts on it at the start and what are they now? Well, firstly, I didn't have thoughts on it that it would weaken the union because I never thought it was going to come about. It seems such a ridiculous uh, proposal that I, I didn't think it was possible. When it did come about, I didn't take the view that it would weaken the union. I, I thought there was a rush of blood to the head and parts of many people in the, the media. And there was a lot of alarmism going on that uh, United Ireland's just around the corner. But I, I thought when the dust has settled, we'd find out 
and what we've known anyway, that a united Ireland will come, not as a result of Brexit, but only as a result of what the majority of people in the North think and of a majority of people in the North decide that there will be a united Ireland. At the moment, I don't see that majority uh, haven't come into place. And that's why I, I don't think that there will be United Ireland. And I do suspect that at some point they will reframe and subvert the 50 plus one clause in the, the Good Friday Agreement and they will work towards creating uh, a, a weighted majority that in order for constitutional change to come about you're going to have to have 60% uh, voting in favour. So I think all these things are, are, are out there. Uh, and I, I, I would like to see you need to I won't. Uh, and I don't think uh, it, it's in the near future. I don't foresee it happening within the next 30 years. No matter what Mary Lou says, uh, it's all rhetoric because at the end of the day, they get into government, they do what all parties do in government. And what would, would mean the. I, there's a, all parties, the government in any society has to perform a structural function. And Sinn Féin will do the exact same. And that structural function does not require the end of partition. Growing up in the North in 1957, the year you were born, before the Troubles, tell me what that was like. Well, I remember I, I when I, I was born, uh, my parents moved very shortly after I was born to South Belfast. I think I first moved to University Street and then to the first family home that I remember, which was in Baggett Street, 23 Baggett Street. We, when we moved in, I have no memory of it, but where my father and mother were telling me about we were the only Catholics in the street. Uh, by the time we moved out of it, there were, there were every, everybody in the street was Catholic. We uh, were one of the, the only family on the 11th of July or 12th of July. We had an X put on our door, dog on our door. Uh, now, my memory of growing up was that our Protestant neighbours were very kind people. They were never, uh, I was probably more of a devil to them than they ever were to me. They were very nice. There was a guy at the corner of the street, he used to be. Uh, uh, he, he was a, an orange man called Alex McDonald. He lived in McClure Street, just around the corner from us. And he run a furniture, he didn't run a furniture business, but he drove a lorry for his, a, a furniture business. And he went at Easter and stuff when I was off work. He would get me to come with him in the lorry and help him out with all the, the lifting the furniture and stuff. <clears throat> and he paid me, he paid me three pounds for uh, three days and a pound a day. I mean, it was good then you know, for the amount of stuff that I'd done and I, I love getting out with them. And uh, I remember one night, uh, I think it was 1970, going, going into my dad, I'd seen Alex stand at the top of the street with a uniform on. I, I came in and I said to my dad, uh, Daddy, I like, I like McDonald's a pillar and he says he's not, he's a be special. I didn't know what a be special was, you know. But even though he was a be special, he never, ever, nor did his son, who I was very friendly with, Drew, never once did they show one sign of uh, sectarian hostility. And I was the kid, I was the Catholic kid that he brought out, you know, on, on doing the job. So uh, it, it, it was interesting. They used to burn a bonfire at the top of our street, uh, a guy called Lenny Caldwell. He was a teenager. And I always remember my mother used to say, Lenny Cole will be born in the bonfire. Now we would go up or watch it or, and stuff and they never gave us any hassle. There was nothing. Uh, and over the, the, the course of years, the demographic composition of the Lower Omaru began to change. I mean, I remember the guy called Bobby Mitchell. He had a son called Roy and he had another son whose name I forget, the Paul, I think it was. And uh, Bobby used to take us to Linfield matches and he had the two sons signed up as uh, card cam members of the Shankle Tartan. And then when I was in jail in 1982, I think January 1982, Bobby and his son Roy were shot dead in uh, an internal UDA feud over in Castlereagh or Craig or Branyal, that, that part of the Nagala Woods. I remember feeling sorry for him, uh, thinking, you know, yeah, he was a sort of... Uh, a decent stadium, but very, very staunch, fervent loyalist. 
Uh, but I, I remember singing Roy Dan at 21, Bobby Dan, and you know, saying, strangely enough, when I, I was brought out to, to Castle Ray uh, one time uh, for one of them Supergrass trials, and we're just sitting there, and the cops were interrogating us, and this time we were talking to them, just chatting away, and we we're talking about Bobby Bobby getting killed, and he, one, of the, one of the cops that said, Yeah, it was a. Uh, it was a pretty nasty one, you know, but this is what happens when you get involved in these things. It sounds like that had a big impact on you, Anthony. And, I mean, what's your earliest memories of the Troubles breaking out? Well, I remember the Troubles breaking out very well because it was an exciting time. And I remember going up uh, on the morning of after the uh, burnings on the Falls Road, I remember going up with three other kids to the Falls Road and going up the street, uh, Conway Street, I think it was. And that smell of burning furniture that had been doused by water, firemen, still, I can still feel that. I can still sense that in my nostrils each time I talk it. It's a peculiar, pungent odour. And we went up and I remember we came back with this thing. Somebody found what looked like a, a tin of something. And there seemed to be like a, what looked to us like a, the end. Well, we were very young, but it looked to us like the end of a, a pump. Uh, when you, the only attachment that you put into the ball or you put into your bag. Well, there was this scene of thing. But anyway, we were all sitting in the real way playing with it and bang, an immersive bang. I remember feeling the, the, uh, they get into hot shards or something in my legs and my hands. Very, very minor. And this ringing in my ears and the floors. But we thought no more of it. I think what had happened, it was a detonator. And wow. I don't know if it was a bomb or anything, but we certainly left. We could have all been killed or blinded or stuff. Uh, and I remember that morning very, very well. And I remember, uh, you know, when it happened, I went around. I, my dad used to send me around to get the Irish News around in my cracking shop in the front of the lower on the road. And I, I had read it on the way back of four people who'd been shot dead. And they said to my dad, when do you think a shooting will start? And he says, nah, shortly enough. And I says, it already has. There's four people dead. And he gave to get the f- paper from me. Uh, so I have their memories. But I have memories of growing up. See, I was a, I mean, I was a Glen Torn supporter, as you can see. <laughs> And then when I, I uh, as a Glen Torn supporter, there were a, a, a unionist uh, part of the city. They came from, they were, their ground, the Oval was in the, the heart of East Belfast, just off D Street, the lower Newton Arch Road. So I used to go over there to their games uh, until we got beat up one day, myself and a friend. But, and uh, I remember we used to love the bonfires. Uh, the, 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 and we used to collect for them and burn the bonfires for the 12th. And I remember, Potty Callaghan's wife saying, why not just collect for the 15th instead of collecting for the 12th? But we didn't know. We had no real sort of idea. I mean, it was a, it seemed to us to be a cultural thing. And then we would go up and watch them, the bands. And we, we loved the noisy bands, which would be today known as the Blood and Thunder or the, the Kick the Pope bands. They were the best. So there was that sort of environment growing up. But over the course of time, I mean, my Protestant friends and stuff then, over the course of time, it all changed. You know, Protestants moved out. British Army came on the streets. First were welcome, then they were hated. So you grew up, no sectarianism, and then the troubles happened. And did it feel like it kind of went away overnight, that harmony? No, well, it wasn't exactly harmony. I'll tell you why. I had experiences probably that shaped my... My perspective, uh, when I was young and st- used to stay with my grandma in uh, my granny in Glenmacken Street, uh, which is the last street in the village area of Belfast, South Belfast, before you reach the M1 uh, and the Blackwater River. And I remember one time getting beat up by kids from Bimborb Street, which was, there was, uh, next street was Lakeel Street, Glenmacken, Lakeel, Bimborb, Havana. Uh, they were from Ben Board Street and, and they kept getting beat up and called a, a, a teeing and a Fenian bastard and stuff. And that made me think. And then I was getting beat up by Protestant kids and uh, from Sandy Row in the railway lane. Myself and David Young went down one time. David Young was my Protestant friend. 
and they only beat me up. So these things began to, I mean, shape, uh, the, the, you know, my attitude. And I, 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 I thought for some reason that people who were Protestants, you know, had a, a potential to do me harm. And I mean, I would have grown up resentful and wanted to get my own back on them. Uh, and then at, at school, you know, I, well, I was always trouble maker anyway at school, but at school, I, I, I remember getting attacked on a bus by them. Uh, one time they got on a bus. But I, I funny enough, I, that was a day I had brought a bag full of bricks onto the bus because what we were going to do, we were going to drop them on a bus shelter as the bus stopped just to frighten everybody. Sure, another vandalism, not to break the bus shelter, but uh, just frighten everybody for a laugh. And I had the bricks. So when they came up and beat me up, as they were going down the stairs, I'm down off them with the bricks and I battered them. These were men. Uh, they wouldn't, they, they battered them with bricks down them stairs. <laughs> they got more damage than I did and they jumped off the bus. <laughs> but I remember getting a different bus to school off that. That was a 20, uh, and it was a 76 uh, Gilna Herc. And off that, I got the 20 Tully Carnet to avoid them. <laughs> what age were you then, Anthony? Uh, I had been 12. 12. So, did you have a hatred for Protestants or was it a fear? I think it was a fear, and quickly, you know, you, you can very quickly hit what you fear. You know, what makes you frightened and nervous, you will grow to hit. And I, I developed what I, uh, I would say over the years, I became a, a proper little sectarian bigot. Uh, I, I, I did uh, have a hatred and a fear. Well, and do you find that hard to admit? And did you find it hard to come to the realization that you were a bigot? Well, I think I came to the realization that I was a bigot after I'd stopped being a bigot. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I don't find it hard to admit. No, I, I was a bigot. It's, 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 it's hard or as easy to admit that I was an IRA gunman, that I was an IRA killer. Uh, it, it's what happened. Uh, uh, and I, I did come to the realization that, that I had been a bigot in my young days. And the strange thing is, I remember walking around the jail in nineteen seventy five. I was in jail in nineteen seventy five in McGilligan. I myself and another guy from a narrated from different Belfast, and he said to me, "Well, what are you going to do when you get out?" And I says, "I'm going to hit the orange man. I'm going to hit them. I'm going to hit them sore." And um, he only said to me, ah, so you're going to go after Orndi? There's no attempt to dissuade me from it uh, or anything. So, I mean, that was my attitude and I got out and uh, I, I had a sectarian attitude. And I remember coming back in and Brent Hughes saying to me, not, not a good attitude to have, not a good attitude. And then <laughs> at what point does it leave you? I, I don't know. It's easy to say, but uh, I mean... <laughs> You're 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 meeting sort of screws and stuff, and you know some of the like the two most decent screws that I met in the jail. One was both were ex cops and they were Protestants, you know. And this one called Freddie Chambers used to, you know, nineteen seventy six. If I hadn't got books, Freddie would say, "What what books are you looking for?" And I'd say, "Well, Sven Hassel's." And that's what I was reading at the time. Sven Hassel's. I haven't got. Uh, Maybe SS General or haven't got a same like a Stalborn. Fairly bring them in from home, you know. And you knew that these guys were good, uh, I mean, decent people, but I mean, these, I, you can have an idea of a person being decent, but from he's from a very decent community. That's the way you think. And you get sort of separated these in your mind. I know by, I mean, after I get out of prison, I know that I'd, uh, very, very little. I had no sectarian animosity, certainly, uh, towards Protestants. I had been hostile to the UDA and the UVF. But, I mean, it, it met some of these guys in the workout scheme. It met John White, who was the, the UFF uh, guy who was convicted of killing Putty, Senator Putty Wilson and uh, uh, Aaron Andrews. And John White, White had a vicious reputation. I remember meeting him in the jail uh, when they were in the workout. <coughs> well, I mean, I got on with him. They were friendly enough. I, I, I met others that I, I was very friendly with. Uh, I, 
guy, Jordy McMacken from Rathcool, me and him were thick as thieves. Uh, Jordy used to come in and he, he'd bring joints in and we'd sit and smoke a joint in his, his cell and talk football, talk nonsense. Others who were, you know, Wesley, I forget his second name, he died a couple of years ago, Wesley, a uh, UVF prisoner. He was a Crusaders fan, as a Glen Torn fan, so me and him would talk soccer. Uh, you know, like you'd meet these guys. And so when I get out just in front of them, they were, they were staging it. I remember getting a bottle of vodka and coming down and meeting them all at the, the bus station for they were going back uh the, the Ulster bus station down in uh, Glengall Street. I'm going over and seeing John wait and saying, well, how are you as well, John? There's a bottle of vodka for the boys, you know, and uh, giving it to him and him, he, him saying thanks. And now he went up and shared it out with them all. I mean, he wasn't a packet of it, so... How, how were you able to have that trust, Anthony? Because as we know, during the Troubles, I mean, people were being killed, I mean, every week. And, you know, you were mortal enemies. Well, we were, but we had also, we were also prisoners and we were out on the workout scheme. We'd all serve life sentences. There was no risk to me going to Glengall Street to give him a bottle of, uh, a bottle of vodka. I met them all, shook hands them all. Uh, I mean, you Republicans and loyalists, and it just threw threw them in this battle of vodka. I remember one time, one of them that I was working out with, uh, and I, I happened to be in Stewart's before it became Tesco's at the bottom of the Donegal Road, right beside the M1, and one of the loyalist lifers was in with his wife, Shabon, and I says, you're taking a bit of a chance. He says, actually, I'm not, I'm not, I won't be too long until I'm out. And uh, I says, if I was you, I'd just wouldn't shop here. I was friendly with him. I wasn't threatening him. I was just saying to him, I'd be careful. Because they're ha- just across the street in the park centre, our UDR man had been marched out one time and shot dead. There, I went in and lifted him. And so I felt, I just said, that guy, you know, someone dangerous, you know. And uh, like we used to come home. Uh, I remember us driving home uh, and, and dropping. We had to drop a guy called Jimmy Campbell. Up at his house in, I think it was Bally Sill. Here's me, Tommy McCurney, and somebody else, and we, we dropped him there. And uh, Jimmy Campbell was in for having carried out the, uh, the McGurk's Bar pub bombing. So it was that sort of relationship uh, that, 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 that could have, you know, that you did have with them. Uh, you could be friendly with them. And, and I remember meeting them in town, a guy who, a guy we had known was Sammy Schuster. I uh, was a loyalist, and Sammy had died a year after he got out, but just, you know, he had a heart attack, but just before he, he, I mean, he had seen him one time in town, I think he was with his wife, and stopped me, shook hands, and I was slagging him and bantering him at the very bottom of Castle Street, you know. So we could have had friendship with them. Uh, I mean, one of the people who I developed a very close friendship with over the years was, uh, I don't see him now, like, but it was David Adams, David Adams, uh, was a sort of, he was involved in UDA talks and stuff, and I met David at conferences, and me and him got on like a house and fire. But I always found, I mean, I could, you know, there was a degree of trust, because a number of years ago when Billy Mitchell was still alive now, it's a way, because Billy Mitchell died in 2005. 2006. Billy Mitchell took myself and another Republican into the uh, one of the estates in, in Ottawa. I think it was the Stales estate. Uh, it was the, the Loyalist estate, and I might have just mixed up the name, but I think it's the Stales estate in the community centre to meet with the leadership of the UVF to try and uh, mediate because there was tension, interface tension. I mean, we went in, we caught him and killed, but we t- took absolute trust that we wouldn't. We had trust in Billy Mitchell. Wow. I had also served on the magazine board of editors, uh, along with Billy Mitchell of the other view. So me would develop this trust. You know, I remember when my child was born, I uh, took her over to, to see Billy Mitchell and all in their wee uh, office at the corner of uh, Link Center, I think it was called, at the corner of the the York Road, just up from uh, York Gate. And uh, oh, they're all fussed and everything over and Billy's wife was there. And at my wedding, my, myself and Carrie's wedding, somebody somebody says, this is the strangest wedding ever there. You have the UVF sitting Billy Mitchell and you have the real IRA, uh, Marianne Price. <laughs> She's doing best woman. And, you know, like it was a sort of, it's, it's just the way we, we, we developed over the years. And now I think I, I can genuinely say that I do not have one sectarian thought in my head. No one. Take me back to you're a, a teenage boy and 
you start uh, thinking about republicanism? Uh, sometimes I wonder if you think about republicanism or if you drink uh, republicanism. It's just something that you, you absorb. Uh, I didn't grow up in a particularly Republican environment. My mother or father weren't Republicans as such. I remember one of the early films I watched was uh, She Comes the Devil, James Cagney. Uh, I had an interest in the IRA because it seemed romantic and like, like that. But uh, I, I know from early on that I was to get starting to develop a strong hostility to the British Army uh, and, the, and the RUC. Uh, they were attacking people, and particularly we would watch. They could, even though we turned against them by this stage, but in the late seventy, early nineteen seventy one, we used to watch the rats on TV and Dari, and the Dari riders seemed the best riders in the world because they were up close and personal. This was hand to hand fighting, and we thought it was really brave and really courageous. And then when I mean the British shot uh, Desmond Beatty and a guy called Cusack and Dari in seventy one, it infuriated us. And so that we would take part in rides. I remember in the morning of them, the night before internment riding in Leeson Street in the Gravener Road, and the day after it, uh, all day internment riding in the Gravener Road. Uh, the Falls Road, uh, barricades. We fought all day with the British. Uh, they threatened to shoot us dead at one point to talk out the loud hitter and said if we weren't off the streets within 60 seconds, he'd order his troops to fire. And we, we ran the uh, ton of battles down on top of them. Uh, and the following night, and they did over at the English's bakery, the gun battle, the rats, and all. So, I mean, like, you were gravitating towards it. I had seen what I, why were people like me from the type of community that I'm from that go to the same type of school, that goes to the same type of church, uh, supports the same type of football teams? Even when I was thinking of Celtic and Disturley, even though I supported, <laughs> I supported Glen Torn, I'd have been the traitor. Uh, I think, why are they been attacked by the state? So I, 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 I gravitated into armed republicanism uh, quite easily. Can you talk about how you got involved with the IRA? Well, I mean, I was in the, the, the FINA uh, very early on, the, the official FINA. It was the only FINA in our area. And when I left it, uh, I was involved in riding and stuff and running uh, for, for, for the IRA that asked you to do something. Uh, I mean, when I turned 16, uh, the, and, and then we were doing a lot of sort of, I mean, we had friends who were in the IRA, uh, friends who had been in the official funeral with us were now in the IRA, and they uh, were out carrying out the operations and you know doing things and they would say could you keep a watch or could you go and see somebody if you deliver a message and then when we did this we were three of us were on team they asked us would we like to join this is towards the end of 1973 and uh, we said I, I was the only one who ended up joining uh, we all said yes at the start but I sort of stayed the, the course uh, and I, so I was a fully fledged uh, member of the IRA when I was 16 and it wasn't that long after that that he carried out the murder that would see you jailed for life? Well, it was about, I suppose, the dead term, three years, not long, but at that age, three years was a long time. Uh, let me see. I, I'd went in, see, very short, I mean, I went into prison in April 1974. And I went into prison. They had raided my house and had found something about a uh, detail about a bombing run. Uh, they arrested me. I went on the run. They arrested me. I mean, why I was right on the run? I uh, had worked with Freddy Scapatici, strangely enough, in, in the markets. And he had eventually got me down to didn't talk, but I came back up because I was fed up with it. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, Freddy Scabatici got me over to the Strand and the safe house, came over, briefed me, told me what they expect, then came around later to another safe house, got me off to the dock. Uh, uh, but I ended up getting caught. Uh, and I remember them Brits used to send the people, uh, he's a gunman, uh, he'll be shot and said. And I kept getting told, I didn't believe it was to be shot and said, but they, they, they kept saying it anyway. And, Oh, I know the night that they captured me, the first night they said, uh, oh, we've got the gun, man. 
but they sort of I, two days later I was out because he put he reminded me to some public home and I, I was out of it that quickly by the time the IRA came up to spring me I was already in Turf Lodge uh, so I was back uh, doing IRA activity I ended up in jail 16 uh, they remanded to Crumlin Road Jail and sentenced got a two year sentence got out at the end of 1975 in November 1975 the 5th of November and came back in on the 27th of February and I came back in uh, accused of uh, killing a guy called Kenneth Lanahan who was a member of the EVF and Donegal Pass and shooting three of his uh uh, his companions or his colleagues. Uh, uh, I, I get a life sentence, sentence a 25 year recommendation in uh, jail. I remember uh, when the judge gave me the, the, the sentence, I laughed uh, at him and I got called in the Belfast Telegraph laughing killer jail for life. It was teenage bravado, you know. Uh, wasn't weren't laughing at the family or anything. Although I suppose at the day, uh, back in the day, I could have laughed at them as easily, but I wasn't thinking them at the time. Uh, I was just laughing at the judge and treating the judge with sort of teenage arrogance, teenage contempt. And Kenneth Lenehan was a thirty-five-year-old doorman who was shot dead as he worked outside Victor's mm-hmm. Bar which was close to the Loyalist Donegal mm. Pass and not too far from where you were living. Well, I actually lived in Twinburg, but the best stage. But right. uh, I was involved with the IRA in uh, South mm. Belfast. I was a sort of, I get described by the Sunday Times as a South Belfast IRA commander, which is sort of highfalutin jargon for being the OC of the Lower Armour Road. Um, I... Uh, yeah, that's right, yeah, yep. yeah. What, what they said there. You spoke about being in court and laughing at the judge. Mm-hmm. And did you see Kenneth Lenehan's family? I seen his father one time coming up. Uh, his father came up to give evidence. Uh, not that the only evidence he gave was of uh, being, the, the, he identified his son uh, and he, he, he gave that evidence. And uh, he he went up and into the box and then and then came down, uh, and passed us. And he looked a very, <coughs> I mean, he looked to be a sort of. Uh, he didn't seem to be a wealthy man. He seemed to have a shabby shirt on him, and I, I remember and I also talked to some of the people about this. Uh, you had that moment's uh, thought of what the fuck have we done to this man. You know, but it's a quickly passed, you know, but it was a, a it was like a, a heart ransom moment because I remembered very well. I remember sitting in the, in the, in the dock and he had a red uh, checked shirt, but it looked, he looked shabby, working class, not just on camp, not dirty, just as if a man who didn't have a lot. And I remember having that sort of uh, moment sitting uh, you know, didn't say much of it. Later said, you know, that wasn't a moment that I enjoyed. Actually, you know. When you went out that night, Anthony, to kill someone, I mean, what goes through your head? Do you just see it as an IRA operation? Do you let any sort of emotion come into your head? Do you see this as, I mean, a bit to? A closer step to free in Ireland? Yeah, I don't think you think in terms of free in Ireland. You think in terms of the IRA operation, it was something to get done. Uh, there, I had been out all week, uh, not saying doing, or not, not, well, I was been out all week, not succeeding at doing what I was trying to do. Uh, so Friday night, I had said, right, you know, I, I, I'm off tonight, I'm, I'm going to do something else. And, we had arranged the, the operation and there was a problem getting the car and I said, well, fuck it, I'll get it, I'll go So I, I came around and put the heavy hand on and uh, once I get the car, it says I'll do the operation myself. And uh, we went out, uh, down to do it. Uh, and this is one of the strange things uh, about this because years later I appeared in uh, court on a supergrass trial 
And one of the guys who we, I wasn't, but part of the team they were with, who were accused of trying to plotting to kill was a guy called Norman Rooney. And Norman Rooney came into the witness box and gave evidence that he had never been a target, he'd never been in anything, and nobody had any reason to go for him. So he had no knowledge whatsoever that the IRA were trying to kill him. I'm sitting watching this, I'm just thinking to myself, this is bizarre, because that very night, as we were driving down to uh, take, take out the doorman, we, we, we knew the doorman, we had a reason to believe he was armed, and I'll go into some detail about that later, but we had believed the UVF doorman was armed anyway, so we'd go down with it, says, right, we'll take him out. We, on the drive round, first thing, we, we'd come to another pub, and uh, we'd stopped and we'd said, right, we'll go and see if there's any of the, the, the local UVF about, you know, because like, if you're going to do them, if you can get them here, don't miss the opportunity we went in. Uh, and we had the, the arms, uh, but there was a three men, four men sitting there and they were elderly, you know, and I just sit back, back, out, out, out. And we get back out in the car and round. And as we're driving around to the target that we were supposed to be, going for we met Norman Rooney walking past and I said fuck where's Rooney get get round get round get round to get him but by the time we get round I mean, he was a target we knew exactly where we lived he lived we used to walk past his mother's house and she was out doing her day with her new her wee cloth cleaning cleaning the front door porch and we drove around and Rooney had somehow been in the house or something, so he avoided getting, getting shot. He, he, he'd he have been as good a target. So we ended up back where we were supposed to be after a circuitous route and uh, focused on the, 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 the guy who we, you know, this is a case of thinking. I mean, that looks very much like the main mom. Fortunately for us, for us, I suppose, unfortunately for him, he, he was the main man. Uh, and we ended up shooting him dead and injuring uh, three others. And then we drove off and uh, le left the car in the markets, uh, left it, got the guns away, uh, and then we headed over to a white house in Davis Flats and get cleaned the back. What did you feel like afterwards when you were able to go into your house and, and sit alone? Did you feel any guilt? No, I, I, I didn't feel guilt. I, uh, I felt, you know, mixed, mixed feelings, you know, you, you like, he felt disappointed that only one had died. And at the same time, uh, saying it's wrong to wish the more would die, you know, because I believe in God at that time and stuff. And, you know, I, I, these mixed feelings, uh, because I was arrested about five hours after because of the guy whose car was hijacked had sort of identified me. And uh, I uh, I didn't, I can't say that I felt any guilt. I felt more guilt at wanting more to have died. And the, the problem was that the only guy who was the, the target at that bar was the guy who actually died. So it didn't make any sense to want more people dead. But... It was like, you know, if you're going to be hung for a sheep, you may as well be, if you're going to be hung for a lamb, you may as well be hung for a sheep, you know, let, let them all die. And how did you juggle that with your your faith, your belief in God, which you, quite obviously was important to you because you mentioned it? Well, look, there's an old saying by a woman called Annie Lamont, that you know God's in your side when he hates all the same people you do. It's easy enough, I can say it. God's just an excuse that people use to justify their badness or the things that they do. So you were jailed for 25 years. That was appealed. The The charges were murder, three attempted murders, hijacking and possession of a weapon. Can you remember the first time you held a gun? I think it would have been 19... Well, you could hold the British Army guns. They would always let you hold them in the street. I think it was uh, the first time I held an illegal gun. Yeah, it would have been 71. What age were you then? 14. Wow. And 
Were you excited as a 14 year old? Was there any fear? Were you intimidated by it? No, I wasn't, but I was very excited when I was allowed to fire a Thompson gun at, uh, at that age. At that age? Yeah. How could a 14 year old even hold one? Well, it was on a uh, single shot. They, they, right. they were letting me fire it. Uh, I was on single shot and then I fired three shots from it at a, at a barrel. And I take it that was senior IRA men who would have yeah. helped that happen. Yeah, yeah. And did your parents have any idea you were involved in this? Well, they knew I was involved in, in, in the Fianna. They, they didn't particularly like it. Uh, they, when I was 16, they knew I was heavily involved in, in the IRA, yeah. Did they ever try and sit you down and ta- talk you out of it? Not that I remember. Uh, there was a lot of hustle at the time. And, I mean, I was on the run or even, you know, we, we would have hand-to-hand fights, myself and my father, with the, the British Army in our garden. You know, one time they arrested him and they says, uh, the officer said to him, it's twice you and that bastard, violent bastard of a son you have has attacked my soldiers and then fucking garden ears. My dad was laughing at it, you know, which was... Uh, I, had rec- I was getting into the house and I was sitting and I got into the kitchen and the living room and I looked across and see my dad sitting in the chair in the corner. He looked at me, it's a big black hand, uh, gloved, black gloved hand around my throat, pulled me out. And by the time when he took the hand off, I chinned him and with a fit. Uh, and my dad came out and he, he, he was a heavy digger, so he put him down. And then the, 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 the jeeps came up and they said... Uh, Right, the, you have to reach an agreement here. We'll have to, it has to be searched. So I said, fine. My dad says, you're fine to be searched. I said, yeah. But when I was getting searched, your mom kicked me. So I started all off again with bit them and the, the best time a crowd at Gellert and the Brits were really, uh, they were getting nervous. So they backed off and, you know, down an hour night, I, I came running into the house and turned on behind me. And I said, hey, run us through. And I'm saying, divert the bastards as I was getting out. And they, they come in, they, they, they print, so where is he? And my dad says up the stairs, and they come up the stairs, and I bet him over the walls and away, and he come down and says, where? He's not up the stairs, and my dad says, I don't give a fuck where he is. You know, so they arrested him and uh, war fights and stuff. So you were jailed in 19, you were sorry, you were sentenced in 1977. Yeah. And... The blanket protest had already started because you were on remand from 1976. The blanket protest started in September 76 with Kieran News. I think it was the 14th of September, but I had a uh, special category status, political status, so I went to the cages of uh, Long Cash Royal and the Blacks. And after an allegation that, the, that, that I had tried to escape uh, on the uh, June, I went on to the blanket. Uh, I was in the boards as a punishment black for about two weeks and then the NIO sent me up on the 12th of July of all days to the blankets. They divested me of my political status, my special category status, so I had to go on the, uh, the, the blanket protest. You had to go on? Oh, was I, there no, no choice? Well, well the choice was limited, but I had to go on because you know, for me there was no choice. I wasn't going anywhere else. I mean, the, the, the notion of not getting on the blanket protest simply seemed abhorrent to me. So, yeah, there was nowhere else to go. Did you know how hard it was going to be? Because I have spoken to former IRA men who were involved, and I mean, it's it sounds horrendous. Well, I didn't know how hard it was going to be. Uh, I didn't think it was going to be as long. But, I, I mean, I came on it. Uh, what I was surprised at the first day but coming on it was uh, the screws, Tommy Keenan, a guy called Tommy Keenan, and another guy called Fred Stanton. And they're actually very polite, because I was expecting a beaten. Uh, nothing to replate, uh, brought down the wing, and I was bracing myself the whole time because I says, I'm afraid I'll vomit, I'll vomit, I'll vomit. I got in the cell, there's absolutely no smell or anything, the, the canned food, all the things would hurt, so... Uh, and then the governor came round and I was in Selby again. As soon as the governor came round to adjudicate, I was only on the wing about an hour, half an hour. The role, he started saying, this is what you're doing. He's up banging a piss pad and hooting and tooting in the governor's face and screaming at him. And uh, yeah, I was supposed to do it too, but I just stood there saying him because <laughs> this was madness to me. And I knew it sooner or later we'd get into it, but at the moment it was just seemed crazy. And the governor was a guy called Chambers, and he leaned over and whispered in my ear. He says, you know, they need to shout at me or they can make himself heard. 
But because I wasn't banging, I could hear him. And he says, if you don't leave this, you'll end up as mad as him. And I said to myself, well, maybe the governor's right. <laughs> but mad, so it'll so be it. What was the toughest part of it all, Anthony? Well, I mean, the, 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 one of the worst parts was the anticipation of violence. Uh, because they were violent, uh, and they were violent every day against somebody. You know, you could go a whole days, weeks without anything happening in your wing. But they were violent. There's always some report come back of violence or somebody getting bit. And quite often there was in your wing. Uh, myself and a guy called Christopher McKnight got a very bad beating in 1978, September 1978, forced wishes. Uh, the doctor came in and said we were too dirty, so we had to be wiped for, for to stop the spread of disease, some excuse. Mm-hmm. And the beating they gave us was really bad. And this uh, is the prison guards, the, yeah. the riot squad? Not the riot squad, prison guards. Uh, and I met them later, many, many years later, like, and uh, <laughs> it was strange because uh, in the different circumstances, you know, they, 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 were, they were different guys. You know, like, uh, now, one of them wasn't, because, and he ended up getting killed by the IRA in 1988, the guy called Brown Armour. Uh, and, and I had written a piece about Brown Armour, you know, and saying, like, I mean, had I have been there, you know, uh, you know, just at a, at a, threw a blanket over him and sort of walked on, uh, different sort of victory of the, the blanket man, the passivity of the blanket protest over his violence. And his daughter wrote to me, uh, and she said, this is horrible what you've said about my daddy. My daddy was a good man. Uh, so I wrote back to her and I said, look, I don't understand how you feel, but I had a different experience of your father. And, uh, she says maybe he was that way because of circumstances. And uh, we had this very pleasant exchange. Uh, and then the, the, the final email, she said that she was very, very nice at the end. She says, don't be saying anything bad about my daddy again. <laughs> I laughed, you know. And I mean, from her point of view, I'm sure Brian Armour was a very good father. I'm sure he was a loving husband. I'm sure his kids loved him. But I had a different experience with Brian. Uh, I remember, funny enough, we, we I know a guy who, the former blanket man, who still goes up to Brian's grave and talks to Brian. Uh, and uh, and he, he says, it would free you, Brian, it wasn't worth it, you know? And I, go, uh, I don't think I'd, I don't know why I said them before. I will go up and I remember when we were drunk, I says, we'll go up and piss in his grave, you know? But that's all nonsense, no chance of me ever pissing in his grave. But um, and funny enough, like some of them were valuable ones. I remember years later, they come on the one of them come on the wing, and we were in total charge of the wing at this time. And he says to them, "Do you want a cup of coffee, Billy?" He says, "I'll take your cup." He says, "Do you want something to eat?" But he says, "Have you a Mars bar?" So got him a Mars bar. Give him his tea. There's coffee and it's a Mars bar. But on the way, you know, like it would sort of said, "What happened? Happened?" You know. So, how would you describe those three years for you? Is it something that you're proud of doing? Is it something? I mean, obviously, you, you want you would have wanted to avoid it if you could. What way do you look back on it? Well, I look back on it as a major spur to intellectual and the development because the while I spoke to you earlier about the violence you've been present. The biggest challenge of the blanket was the tedium, the soul-destroying boredom. And you never wanted it to be punctuated by violence, but it was soul-destroying. And there was a Bible, the only thing that you had to read from, I mean, they used to give you some religious magazines and there were, I mean, the likes of reality was good because the philosophical one, I mean, it was there, we first became familiar with the views of Camus and Sartre. Um, and then there was one by a guy called Louis Watt about communism and religion and I, I became very familiar with some of the concepts and ideas in it and uh, uh, but the, the, the all that had gone by February 79 so you'd be able but I do remember one time a board of visitors woman coming in and sent any requests she said pop us out bastard so I said I suppose uh, some reading material wouldn't go amiss and she said use a good book I said, tell you what, Mrs. I'll never fucking read it. I'll use it. I says, make good cigarette roll-ups, and uh, I'll keep my feet warm. 
during the fucking winter, I will use it as toilet roll. The fuck will I ever read it? And I never did. I simply point blank refused to read the fucking thing from that point on. We used to say it's good, but the Bible's very good for the soul. Because what I used to do, and I'm sure everybody else did it during the winter, was when the, we wanted to talk at the window, right? You could stand on the floor, but the floor was too cold. And we were naked. We All we had was a blanket. and so, Or you could stand on the pipes, but the pipes were too warm. So you put your Bible on the floor and you stand on the Bible. And so the Bible, the, the coldness of the floor didn't get through to the Bible. Wow. And that, so that's, that, that was my view of, of the Bible. Uh, and that's what you meant by warming your feet? Uh, the, the, the Bible, yeah, well, it says the Bible's good for your soul. It's only your feet. Did you feel like you were ever going to get out of prison? You were going through all these phases. I mean, you were going through the blanket, then it came on to the hunger strikes. Did it feel never ending? No, I, we always felt there'd be a future. Right. You know, we, we always felt, this is the strange thing about the hunger strikes, we always felt, that, that I always felt there would be a future. I had volunteered for the hunger strikes and Beck McFarland had said to me, you know, you're in a position like myself, you're, uh, you are uh, in for what's called a sectarian killing and you'll not, you know, they're not the sort of people that we want on the hunger strikes. Uh, that's what that's what they want because back that's for the reason back was the it, it didn't make a lot of sense uh, at that time yeah. at that time the IRA were denied and involved in sectarian killings and the only person who convicted of a killing that was on the hunger strike was Frank Hughes and Frank Hughes had uh, he he'd been involved in killing the SAS man a paratrooper so that was you know what the IRA could have considered as a pretty good kill our kills people like you mean were getting killed at bars or even though they were members of UVF and it was hard to mm-hmm. hard to put that across. So so paramilitaries were seen, uh, you know, uh, killing other paramilitaries was seen as sectarian killings, but not the security forces? No, the problem was that that wasn't admitted until later that the, right. the Kenneth Lennon was a member of the UVF. Okay. Well, we had known it. Uh, I remember the cops saying in the barracks, your intelligence is as good as ours. Uh, but it wasn't put down. It was just put down as a drive-by killing. So the IRA would have had this view about hunger strikes. I mean, when I, and Haynes said, I'm obviously quite glad that the that, that, that made that decision because the more you think about it, you know, you know, well, I mean, you just wonder, could I have done it? Could I have gone through it? Uh, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. And I know others who was in the cell with people like Lawrence McKeown. Uh, you know, I was very annoyed one time when it was said that uh, the people whose family signed them off the hunger strike did it with a collaboration of the hunger strikers, you know, and that therefore people like it was impl- implicit that people like Lawrence McKeown weren't going to go through with it. Total nonsense. Now, I was in the Lawrence, I knew Lawrence, you know. Uh, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence was sitting for, I'm quite glad that he lives and I'm quite glad that his mother intervened when I look back. But, uh, Lawrence McKeown was for dying on that hunger strike, you know, and I mean, a remarkable bravery, remarkable courage. I'm glad he survived. And at the time, I had convinced myself that I took it to it. But when I look back, or maybe I'm thinking from the benefit of hindsight, and that's a sure could. Whereas today, you know, I don't worry about death, death. I mean, they say I'm the only one would would, would know him, wouldn't know him dead. I don't think death. And my dang's always something to fear, the manner of dying, but been dead. No, it's just like been like operated on, you know. Like best time, best memories of my life for <laughs> things I don't remember, such as the when you're under anesthetic and operation, it's great. And then you wake up and say, What the fuck? <laughs> um Did you know Bobby Sands well? Didn't know him well, but knew him. Uh, had met him uh, one time. They uh, the visits. We went down one time for a, a visit, a, a, an ecclesiastical visit. They called us, called him. So it was a way to get down to meet people from the Orb Blacks in time and take the messages back. So we're in there. South Sid Walsh, uh, Sienna Walsh, Bobby Bobby Sands, and some others from Tumbrook. So we're sitting in a two-hour conversation with Bobby and Sid and uh, and the priests. Uh, Sid Walsh, a guy who I never particularly got on with, you know, but again, when you look back at his form, you know, massive, massive commitment. Uh, you know, this is a guy who got out of jail twice uh, and on 
the second time he got out, he was over here, the had chance of a cushy number, but he didn't. He put the gloves back on, married man, and back in the jail. Yeah, like whatever disagreements you have with people, you have to admire them, people. You know, and I certainly admired him. He was there that day. And the strange thing is, the night of the hunger strike, the first hunger strike ended, which was the 18th of December, 1980. <laughs> the van pulled up in the yard, uh, Bobby. Next thing somebody gets out, we couldn't make out who it was. Next thing our cell opened, the Bobby Sands came in. He's wearing a prison uniform. Myself and Lawrence were in the third day or the fourth day of the hunger strike because we had to do the whole team had been brought on at the end of the 1981. And he came in and he explained to us that uh, the hunger strike uh, was over. The boys were in a bad way and they're going to ask the cardinal to make a statement. And uh, But he came into our cell by mistake. He thought he was going to Pat McGowan's cell because Pat McGowan was on our wing and he was a black OC. And the screws were letting Bobby go around the blacks to brief the black OCs. But the mixed Bob, Pat McGowan's name up with uh, Lawrence McKeown and they put him on wheels. So. so Bobby went out and Lawrence said to me, um, Somebody, Bobby says, uh, the, the, the lad's in a bad way. I said, the hunger strike's over, Lawrence. He's only after telling us over. He says, no, he didn't say that. I says, he did. He says, no. he said, the lad's in a bad way. I says, oh, in a bad way. They're off the hunger strike. So he says, no. <laughs> it was funny. So I said, well, look, we'll wait and pat. And the next thing, Pat announced it. And I don't know how, Lorne, you know, whatever way, talking in the cell. Lawrence just didn't pick up on it. I think he was amazed, about as shocked as I was coming into the cell. I always remember that. Uh, and uh, you had said previously that you believed that when Bobby Sands was elected to Parliament for Fermanagh and South Throne, that would have been the end of the hunger strikes. Well, I, I, I that's so that's a, a, a conclusion I came to many years later. I didn't at the time. I, when I reflected on it long after, it, I, I felt that that was the time to end it. But I do remember uh, not feeling for a minute that we should end it then. And when Lawrence, oh, strangely enough, I always remember when Lawrence McKeown's mother took him off it, I had this punchy hour moment. Punchy hour, you know, Lawrence has lived, Lawrence has survived. Yet, bizarrely, agreeing with the continuation of hunger, sir. I mean, we'd lost the plot. I uh, I think all the evidences are that uh, they uh, they overruled the jail leadership who wanted to end it. Now at the time, I, I could say, right, you know, how they have admitted this when a raw came out and made his allegations? I think most of us could have said, "Nah, well, I mean, the times so where we're in it, you know, I mean, they were trying to get a better deal for the hunger sugars. Uh, and they made a mistake and you know we'd have been very forgiven because nobody wants to be accused you don't want to accuse anybody just for the sake of accusing them and the uh, the lies that they come out with the attempts to smear the labelling of people the labelling of the Boston College project as uh, the work of informers calling me <laughs> not that I care Dr. Anthony Mac Dr. Anthony McIntyre and Donnie Morrison and those people fronted a very vicious campaign uh, against me uh, and the others, and I mean, particularly against Richard Raw, and I've taken the view that 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 has led me to believe that there was no innocent explanation. Otherwise, they would have given one. They just lied out of uh, uh, both sides of their mouths at the same time, and. Uh, I mean, it is a very sad outcome. And I know Lawrence, the, the Sandsmiths and people, I mean, all are very, very courageous people like Pat Sheegan who were in hunger strike also dissent from that view. But I, I just don't think that the evidence supports them. And Bick McFarlane, I mean, Bick McFarlane uh, is one of the people that I met in the prison from early on. And I've always had a, a, a tremendous admiration for, for Brenton. Uh, and I don't share the hostility towards them, but many share as a result uh, of the hunger strike and the way Richard O'Raw has claimed it ended and Richard Drayton and how it ended. Uh, and he, he thinks that Bick should have done more. But I, I think at that time, Brendan McFarlane was a brilliant leader. But, and I, I'm saying, I mean, therefore, the, the, the grace of whatever, go I. I'm not sure I would have made a different decision in, in his uh, position. I think he, his focus was on not just the jail, but the IRA. And I think he had a lot of trust in uh, Adams. Uh, I would like Brent just to, I mean, 
think back and reflect on it and, and come out and state exactly what happened. Uh, but has he gone down in my estimation? No, he has not. And he's one of the people that I most admire. 1992 was when you left prison? Yeah, December the 18th. What was the feeling leaving well, the Hitchblocks that day? It, it wasn't the Hitchblocks I left. We were working, on, uh, working out from McGabry for three months. Right. So you were well out really by that time. The last time, the last day I spent under a prison roof would have been the 17th of December. Uh, and the next day I came out late because the prison dentist had to do something, give me a filling or something. And then they got me a taxi down and, and, and to Belfast to my work. And it just felt good to have it over with. So, you know, uh, just felt good. Was it hard adjusting to normal life? No. Chief Feeney once said to him in the jail, it's never hard. He says it's hard adjusting to the prison when you come back off parole. He says, we're just, when we go out there, we're like ducks in water. I thought it was right. You know, I remember going out in the first time. It was absolutely brilliant, you know, three days trying to pack everything in and then going back in and the place looked so cramped and small and dark and I felt awful depressed and in, in, in the place, you know. Uh, so getting used to it, say, it isn't the problem. It's getting used to it. And say, although I, I think in some ways it has to have a fact that it is in terms of emotional intelligence and emotional maturity and stuff, you know, that maybe you're just not equipped to handle the, the, the world. Uh, if you had had the experience of what I'd said, we, we live different lives. A guy once asked me, like, you lost an awful lot of your life. And I said, I didn't. It was just life lived differently. When you came out, what was the, the thing that you wanted to do the most? Was it a career? Was it again focusing on the Republican movement yeah I, I think that the uh, focusing on, on the movement getting back into the movement uh, and being part of it because we've been so shaped by what had happened and so shaped by the hunger strike that yeah we want, I, I wanted to be a full time activist within the movement were you and I was and were you prepared to go back to prison yeah, I'm always prepared to go back to prison. I'm even prepared to go back to prison today rather than give over one sliver of detail to the cops about uh, Boston College or anything. <laughs> so, uh, and was I prepared to go back to prison? Yeah, I was prepared to go back to prison. When this... Well, if you ask me, when I tell you that I'm prepared to go back to prison today, would I go back to prison today for the IRA armed struggle? Would I fuck to put it very, very... Uh, in, in, on, in the most unparliamentary of language. You left in 1998 when the Good Friday Agreement was signed. Yeah. Why? Well, I felt that the Good Friday Agreement was a complete inversion of everything that we had stood for and everything that we had argued for. Uh, and I, I felt that there was nothing in the Good Friday Agreement. I've been predicting this from the before the Downing Street Declaration, really, and after the Downing Street Declaration, when it more or less began writing publicly in 1983, uh, that, uh, you know, there, there was nothing in it. I, I had argued that everybody has the right to celebrate Christmas, but not the turkeys. There's no point in turkey celebrating Christmas. They get the chop. Republicanism was getting the chop here. And, uh, you know, to pretend that, they, they, I mean, the Good Friday Agreement was something. I mean, and this is the reality. We had to pretend that the Good Friday Agreement was something all on it was. The Good Friday Agreement was the total rejection, political and ethical, of the IRS arms struggle. And I'd said, fine, if that's the way they want to go, but I'm not celebrating it, and I think it's wrong, and, and I, I think we should should never sign up for it. Not that I thought we should go back to war, but I felt that, you know, why should Republicans I mean, even be part of this? Because you were just, if you look at Sinn Féin today, I don't see a lot of difference between them and the rest of them. Uh, they, they, they remind me of all the politicians that we always oppose. And I, I mean, like if you want to kill people to people's legs, you have to at least be serious. And it can, can the Good Friday Agreement justify one single death between the Sunningdale Agreement and the Good Friday Agreement, 24 years of war, for what? Horrific that anybody should die for that. 
Do you still feel that way about the Good Friday Agreement? I do, I do. Uh, now, now, I'm, I'm not saying the Good Friday Agreement is a bad agreement. The, uh, the Good Friday Agreement and a sort of a divided society uh, with... <laughs> Well, there is no overall way of uh, achieving Republican goals and a sort of in a, in a so-called I mean liberal democratic society. The Good Friday Agreement is probably the natural outcome, the obvious outcome to end it. And you know, I have no problems with the likes of the SDLP signing up the Good Friday Agreement and other people, uh, the Alliance and all. That is a manifestation of their politics. That is how the, they, they have conducted their political lives. I mean, John Hume, Alex Adwood, all those people who were in the SDLP uh, and Mark Durkin, they they have every reason to argue for the Good Friday Agreement. Because that philosophy underpinning the Great Friday Agreement was always argued by them anyway and argued against us by them when we were waging our campaign. And for us to turn around and say, well, the Good Friday Agreement's a good agreement, it's good for everybody but the Turkish. And we're very much the Turkish. So I have, I, I, I'm a, I've always been a critic and a dissenter from the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, but, and I think that, you know, uh, uh, when they talk about consent, consent means nothing unless you have the right to dissent. Because if you freely consent, then you can freely withdraw your consent. And I, I reserve the right to dissent from the Good Friday Agreement and seeing nothing in it from a Republican perspective. Uh, but what I oppose it violently, not in the slightest. And I don't endorse anybody that, that opposes it violently. And the Good Friday Agreement is much better in our armed struggle. I just don't. I think it's just a sort of <coughs> a fiction uh, manufactured. I mean, I mean, our support for it anyway was a fiction manufactured to cover the fact that the era had failed. Tell me about the Boston Tips um, or what has become known as the Boston Tips because in 2001 you became involved in an oral history project with a US university, Boston yeah. College. And this is now, would you say, Anthony, synonymous with you? Well, unfortunately, it is synonymous with me. Uh, I probably remember more for the Boston Tips than I remembered for anything else. Uh, I think it in some ways has come to defame me when I'd rather be defamed in other ways. Uh, most people who think of the name Anthony McIntyre probably think that's a toss of it. Uh, <laughs> did get involved in that Boston College project. Look, the Boston College project has come to defend me. I was responsible for uh, the interviews in the Boston College project and Ed Maloney was my project manager uh, and uh, we did what we thought uh, was a, a, a good piece of work. I am of the view that that sort of truth recovery is necessary uh, when I look at what prosecutions have recovered and what courts have recovered I'm saying well I haven't really recovered that much I think that there's more truth to be recovered through Boston College tape projects and it's interesting because when Owen Patterson was Secretary of State and the Brent Hughes book was published by Ed well not the Brent Hughes book as such but the Voices from the Grave uh, a, a, a Patterson, Owen Patterson said that a template for truth recovery could be the Boston College project template. And a month later, there's a subpoena coming through to, trying to sabotage it. So, uh, basically, yeah. for anyone who, who doesn't know about the, the Boston Tips and the Oral History Project, you were one of two researchers. Um, who was carrying out interviews with former paramilitaries um, as part of this college project and, and that information, those interviews, wouldn't be used until after those paramilitaries passed away. Well, there was, that's true. I carried out the Republican interviews, Wilson MacArthur carried out the, the Loyalist interviews. Uh, the undertakings given were that the, the contents of their uh, interviews would not be made public until they uh, had passed away or if they give consent. Uh, 
No, but you, 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 you mean Boston did come at us one time and asked them to give their consent to do it earlier and we wouldn't go for that. But I mean it was with their consent and in one case interviewee Z who's accused of trying to bring down Jerry Adams had actually written into his which Boston College seemed to have lost uh, that there would be no release of his tapes until 30 years after both him and his partner were dead, which meant by the time that had happened, I don't know, I mean, there was, it was not going to be current affairs. I mean, and Jerry mm-hmm. Adams would not have been, uh, well, unless he lives, he's 120. Uh, they wouldn't have been, you know, so, yeah. wouldn't have been arrested, wouldn't have been subject to the public scrutiny. When this first the issues with this project started to arise. I mean, it must have been your worst nightmare as a Republican. It was my worst nightmare as an individual. Uh, it was the most depressing experience in my entire life, and I've had quite a few of them. Uh, and it, it was terrible. It, it was that, you know, <laughs> you had dropped the ball, you felt you had dropped the ball, and somebody else had it and you couldn't get it back. And because you couldn't get it back, all those people's fates, futures, state of mind, everything was now out of your hands. And even though you felt that you were the catalyst for it, that uh, you had some, you felt awful guilt. I felt awful guilt about it. About you know all these people who would be facing arrest, who would be facing uh, possible imprisonment. Uh, yeah, it wasn't nice. I mean, the worst thing that can happen to a researcher is if they fail to protect the their sources. I mean, it's terrible, terrible, terrible. And I, you know, all the things that I was, I was quite prepared to go to jail. I would have sat in jail until I died, <coughs> rather than ever having compromise. But as I say, the ball had been dropped and there was nothing I could do. But at that point, all of them faded and uh, take the case to court and uh, frustrate them at every turn. So can you recall the moment that you were told that the PS9 was seeking to retrieve this information? Did you just brush it off like, oh, well, I just at their work. It's not going anywhere. Did I? Fuck, I remember it right away. I came home from work and my wife had said to me, uh, Ed needs to talk to you. I said, what's up? He says he needs to talk to you. It's very important. And I got on to him right away and he had explained to me and I remember saying to him, well, one of the first things that struck me, the, that they issued a subpoena, said to me, if they issued one, it means that they can issue one. If they can issue one, it means it could all of us issue one. How the fuck did we not uh, get on top of us? How, how, how did we not work us out? And I mean, we've come to the conclusion the reason we didn't work it out is because boss and college failed in their duty of candor. Uh, so that's where it went wrong then? Well, that's from my view where it went wrong. Now, for long enough, it was hard for us to get that argument across, but I think uh, Beth McMurtry and the the, 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 the Times for how they, they sort of education, some uh, Chronicle for Higher Education, Beth McMurtry managed to get that out in a very comprehensive article. And then as time and on, writers like Patrick Rudd and Keith managed to reinforce it uh, and it's just, just it's come round now to I think there's a consensus that Boston uh, messed up. Uh, now that's not able to us of culpability uh, because we messed up too. Uh, we 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 you know things like this can happen. We should have uh, applied due diligence in every aspect. But we, at the time, nobody felt that there would be prosecutions. We were told that the, and the loyalists were told this as well, that there was no chance of uh, there were prosecutions. Wilson MacArthur was told there wouldn't even be a sneak peek at this. Uh, I mean, and unlike the IRA, it's my understanding, the IRA who didn't know about this project, the UVF leadership met with Boston College to uh, discuss it, and they signed off on it. So it wasn't carried out without their knowledge, and they weren't saying it off on anything unless they're absolutely certain that there could be no prosecutions. So I think Boston did and let us down, and then Boston tried to uh, I mean, throw us to the wolves, 
uh, and, and started to blame us. And, and the people like Jack Dunn, their spokesperson, coming out and making some ridiculous assertions, uh, dishonest assertions, and his whole thrust was to protect the institution. Over time, I uh, think, and particularly the work of uh, I mean, Ted Pollis and George, John Loman added to the other work, and this was an academic work, but added to the works I mentioned earlier, they uh, put the college in the, in the frame properly for abdicating this responsibility and duty of care. So correct me if I'm wrong, Anthony, the interview that really kick-started the whole PSNI process to obtain those tips was a newspaper interview with Dolores Price, who, uh, an IRA bomber who um, in 1973 was jailed for an attack on the Old Bailey. You carried that out that interview with Dolores for the Boston College. I did interview yeah. Dol- Dol- Dolores. Dolores was the, the godmother of my son. I had a very good friendship with her. A very good relationship with her. We were very close, and I I conducted that that, that, that series of interviews with the Lewis Press. So, am I right in saying that no one really knew about the Boston College uh, oral history project until that interview with Dolores Price? No, no, I'm trying to remember, but the the, the, the book about uh, the, the book about. Uh, Brent Hughes, ah uh, uh, yes, would have uh, right. w- w- would have alerted, and I'm just trying to remember which came first, and I, I think it was a big Brendan. So, and and again, Brendan, a very good friend of yours, yeah. was he happy to take part in the project? Well, he was delighted mm-hmm. to take part in the project. See, one of the reasons that the book came out is Brent wanted to have his interviews released and mm-hmm. the story out early mm-hmm. I had to persuade him that this would jeopardise the whole project but I gave him an undertaking that when it, when the time came uh, and it was safe to put it out we would put it out uh, and then Brandon's brother came here and he says uh, I know you you or Ed Maloney have tapes and I says I can't really discuss it with, with you uh, Terry uh, and he says well look I'm going to publish what I have uh, but I, 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 I have been told that you, from the family, because Brent had told, I think, his sister, that me and Ed had, had tips. So <laughs> there was a I, there was an obligation, I felt, uh, that I made a, an undertaking to Brent that we would publish. So we, we did. Well, Ed did. And, I, and uh, I had no criticisms of him for it. Was Dolores happy to do the interview, sit down and, and speak to you and and, and, f- and tell what she believed to be her story? But she was. She was very happy. But before it started, I, I, I spoke to Dolores. I briefed her and I told her what we were doing. And then we had an off-the-record discussion. And uh, she was talking about the type of things that she would uh, be discussing because you want to get your questions ready. You want to pr- prepare yourself for discussion. And she told me the... The Jim McConville uh, story. Uh, so I, I, I said to her, daughters, you you know, I, it'd be great to get this story. It's a brilliant story. We'd love to have it for the Boston College uh, project. Uh, but I said, you, I, I mean, I have a duty of courtesy and a duty of candor. And I have to, to, I'm not saying I said it in those words, but I did explain to her that you know, it's okay for you to reveal all this to us, but you have to be sure in your own mind that that this is what you want to do Uh, because once you're dead, you'll be safe from any fallout. I said, but your children may carry the mark of Cain because the killing of Dean McConnell is such an obnoxious event. Uh, And she thought about it and came back and said to me that uh, she wouldn't mention it. And she didn't to me. So and Jim McConville and her, her, her uh, they didn't deal in the interviews. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and when we, we, I made an affidavit to the court, telling the court that I did an interview mm-hmm. uh, daughters about Jim McConville. For anyone who, who doesn't know um, Jim McConville's story, she was a mother of 10 who was abducted and murdered by the IRA and disappeared. I mean, she was furious over the newspaper. She was furious over the Irish news. Um, Why? Because she thinks that she was uh, abused and uh, 
manipulated and, and the family took that, that view. Uh, but but she did willingly share that information about Jim McCombo? Well, 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 she did. And when I say that she, you know, she felt let down, uh, badly let down by the, by, by the Irish News because she didn't, I, I'm not sure she wanted to share it with the Irish News uh, as such. Uh, and she later claimed that she felt uh, manipulated into it. So you've spent the last, I mean, best part of 20 years going through not only the, the project, but I mean, the court proceedings. The, and, and the worst thing about it is that you, you actually took part, you were interviewed for this. So, I mean, not only, I mean, have do you feel guilty for those that trusted you, Anthony? But you've also kind of landed yourself in it, or could have landed yourself in it with some well, of. I'm, I, I'm I'm pretty indifferent to that. I, I philosophical about that. Yeah, it's a nuisance, <laughs> but I I think it was one of the the factors that enhanced the trust, more trust in me. That, that when it did, you know, when it did hit the fan, the proverbial hit the fan. The, the attitude of people who I had interviewed was, well, his owner in there. You know, he didn't set us up. I think Ed took a lot of flack, uh, but then it was easy to give Ed flack because he was removed. He hadn't been part of the the uh, the, the IRA. Uh, uh, and people, you know, I mean, people are looking around sometimes for a scapegoat, you know. I think it was easy, easy for someone to kick Ed. Uh, I think Ed has sort of questions to answer yeah uh, in, in relation to it uh, we all have but this has to be said about Ed that, that had Ed not made two crucial interventions when he did he the whole project would have been with the Boston College of the Hundred the whole lot over that it's still going on and that it was delayed and that they got so very little of it as a result of the interventions that Ed Maloney made. The first one was telling the New York Times what Boston College were about to do and what is happening when Boston College didn't want it out. And the second one was going for our own legal counsel. They were two crucial interventions mm-hmm. that stopped us. Uh, they really stopped the PSNI in, uh, in their terms. So, I mean, at present, we have seen one uh, trial where no charges came out of that at all, no convictions. That was Ivor Bell. Found not guilty. Found not guilty. And then we also have loyalist Winky Ray, who is accused of the murder of two Catholic workmen and the attempted murder of others. And that's ongoing. Is there anything else that could come down the line, Anthony, do you believe? Well, I can't comment on that, and the reason I can't comment on that is I can't uh, leave myself horses of fortune. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't want to go into any detail uh, about anything else. Uh, I think at the moment it, it, it looks unlikely. I mean, you've got all the amnesty proposals uh, coming through. The British are going to do their usual, uh, and not for good reason. I, I agree. Funny enough, I always have with the drop in the prosecutions. I set it off to the Savile Inquiry. I can't see any benefit, any advantage in, in prosecutions. I think the prosecutions raise the bar uh, for truth so high that the strategy of prosecutions is that your your <clears throat> I mean your overall goal is to achieve as few successful outcomes as possible. Yet you keep everybody away from revealing the truth about what happened because they are afraid of prosecution. <coughs> Your family were subjected to an unbelievable amount of harassment and abuse. Mm-hmm. And in fact, your neighbour's house got smeared in excrement mm-hmm. during this. Well, we were subjected to an enormous amount uh, of abuse, intimidation, uh, threats. Um, uh, smearing graffiti up and down the Falls Road, uh, calling us toots and alienation. Was it yep. tough? Probably, I mean, it was, you had to deal with it. Uh, down here, uh, it would have been much tougher had it been living in Belfast. Yeah, yeah because you lived in Drogheda now. You've been here yeah. many years. You're happy. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to live in Drogheda. <laughs> uh you don't I mean, miss Belfast at all? Why? 
I, I, from the day I came down to Dragon, I don't miss it. I, I don't miss the, the, the village mentality, the narrow mindedness. Uh, I remember one time, uh, my daughter came in and she just told me that Protestants are bad. She was six at the time. And, uh, he says, well, why are they bad? And she says, are, are we friend in the street that told her they were bad? Uh, and I says, okay. And I said, why are they bad? She says, well, the shitty. And I says, okay. So the next day, I took her on a bus and I went down to Davy Adams' house. Davy Adams was a loyalist and uh, me and him said, the loyalist was a friend of mine, me and him, good friend, me and him said, having this good long talk. And for the three hours we were there, chewing the fat, his, Davy's mother-in-law, uh, played with my daughter, talked to her. So on the bus back home, I says, did you like the woman? She said, yeah, I did like the woman. I says, and uh, she goody, yeah. I says, she didn't shoot you. Oh, why? I said, because she's a Protestant. So Protestants don't actually shoot you. And I thought that was a worthwhile experience. But when we were down here a number of years, I wrote a piece about that at the time, but you've been down here a number of years and she came in one day and she says, what's a Protestant? And I said, that's a benefit of living in Dragula. She's forgot. <laughs> she forgot mm. what a Protestant mm. was. So it was quite good. I mean, down here, it's because you don't know what anybody is. Yeah. Who, who knows or cares? And then for people like me, uh, I remember one day a guy from North says, see him you're working with, he's a prod. I said, fuck the I care what he is. He fucking can be a Jew or a Muslim, I'm fucking skin of my nose. And you just don't know, and it's not how you relate to people. I, I, mean, I have no religion, and I don't relate to other people by their religion, the lesser religious maniacs trying to sort of ban abortions and tell me that the, 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 the earth is 6,000 years old, and strangely enough, I mean, there's a guy that would come here occasionally to meet him and go out for breakfast. He lives abroad, but he's a free Presbyterian pastor. <laughs> I'd be very friendly with him. Isn't that great? I mean, you you seem happy. You seem happy to be, I mean, away from the thing that you were once so passionate about that it turned you into a killer. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm, you see, I don't believe that I have the right to kill anybody. And when I look back, I don't believe that I had ever the right to kill anybody. I mean, the notion, it strikes me as so arrogant that I can go around and say to people, well, I have the right to kill you. What gives me the right to kill anybody? All I can explain are the circumstances in which it happened and offer mitigation. But as for justification, I don't get into it. I think there's an awful arrogance uh, about this. And then the things that you value then, um, you have different values now. I mean, I think the thing that I most retain from republicanism, even though I wouldn't have been sort of uh, an activist on it, or I mean, there were five isms in republicanism, one of them was secularism. And that's the one that uh, interests me most. I mean, the, the separatism, the socialism, the nationalism, uh, the, the non-sectarianism, you know, the thing in the back of it, and I'm non-sectarian anyway, but, 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 but you know, my, my temperament and my, my outlook is non-sectarian. Yeah, I agree with socialism, nationalism, I'm a fear about. Uh, I'm only on people that actually think that there's value in having one government in the world to solve the global problems, given the global situation that we live in. I agree with the former uh, Tupa Morris leader <coughs> on this, who was the president of Uruguay. Hey, Pepe, uh, that, 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 you know, a world government is probably the way to go. Uh, I know there's major difficulties with it, so it's only a concept. Uh, and how can you ever implement I mean, there's so many divides and nation states and stuff, and nation states still, in many ways, how we, how we conduct international relations. But uh, so I'm not too keen on nationalism, but secularism is the one that I would be pretty active in. You know, I'm in the Humanist Association, I'm in the Atheist Ireland. I would write about the about, uh, end of life. Uh, one of the campaigns that I sort of value or, uh, is the end of life. Uh, end of life Ireland because uh, I just simply, you know, I want to die the way I want to die. I don't want to die. I'm not going to die the way the basic wants me to die. The basic would go fuck himself. 
uh, same abortion. I support the right of every pregnant bishop, bishop not to have abortion, but my name will there be. So I, I, secularism was probably the one thing that I retained from it all. One thing I wanted to ask you about to see if your opinion had changed was in 2004 when you caused some controversy with interviewing the then PSNI Chief Constable Hugh Ord mm. so you could question him from a ra radical Republican perspective. And he said at the time, the war is over and the Brits won. When I get, when I met Hugh Ord, I was meeting the head of a vi victorious police force he was meeting a former member of a defeated army. And you said at the time that you could never support the PSNI and you would never allow your children to join it. Do you still feel that way about the PSNI? Oh, very much so. I mean, if anything, the Boston College thing has since hardened my attitude towards the PSNI. But the PSNI, I mean, I quite like Hugh You know, when, when Hugh Ord was getting uh, criticised uh, for... Uh, his affair and he, he followed a child uh, and I was asked by one of the papers well, what, what are you thinking the genius were up shouting all about what a rascal he was and my view was if you think of things that's happened with what chief constables have done here and all their chief constables and the war crimes and stuff that they've been guilty of what's you are guilty of following a child most natural thing in the world ah Hugh Ord, any day of the week. I like Hugh Ward. Uh, I mean, I, I'm surprised, pleasantly surprised that you, you said cause controversy. I didn't know there was that much interest in it. Uh, a few no, newspaper articles. Hugh, Hugh Ward was a, a, a good interviewer, and that he Carrie arranged the interview, and it was the, but we both interviewed him. And uh, Carrie's my wife, and that she, me and her, Carrie conducted that interview. And I always remember because on the way to it she took a pregnancy test and discovered that she was pregnant so Hugh Ord was the first person we told <laughs> <laughs> that uh, Carrie was pregnant with Ronan oh my that. goodness well you'll never forget that no, interview no, in more ways than no. one last question Anthony and I mean you've 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 answered every mm -hmm. question I've put to you the last one is Operation Canova what do you what's your initial feelings on on what the outcome will be there because I know you knew mm. Freddie Scappatici, uh, John Boucher, who's the lead detective, had it, uh, has said you know, he's had um, calls with MI5. There's 12,000 documents have been obtained, uh, a, a thousand statements. What do you think is going to come out of it or is it going to well, be? I, no, I, I don't think much is going to come out of it. Uh, I, I think we might get a lot of truth. I don't think we're going to get terms of prosecutions. And I think John, I mean, I do think John Butcher approached this with courage and integrity. It's my understanding that when John Butcher took on this job, he was told, you're mad. Don't go near it. I believe that only one person sort of uh, supported him, which was uh, John Stevens or John Stevens. Uh, it's, I, mean, I, I believe that uh, my understanding is that John, Sir John Stevens said to him, if you've got the Cuyonis, go for it. Uh, he certainly had, and I think he has tried and will try to, to do his, his best. Uh, but I still revert back to what Barry McCurry said. And it's often said that this is a Barry McCurry push thing, that this is great to get a solicitor in who, who into the prosecution service and there's evidence of how things can progress. I don't think Barry McCurry was ever behind that. Uh, I don't think he was a main impetus. I think the type of thinking that was going on within the PSNI is sort of reflected in George Hamilton, was probably a greater impetus in getting this sort of uh, and pushing the, the for uh, Scapatici to be uh, investigated. <coughs> now, Barry McCrory did say the people who have the greatest thing to fear from this are those IRA leaders who sanctioned those uh, the, the deaths of people. So when it, so while it's sold publicly as an investigation of the British, I think the it's really an investigation of uh, the the IRA as well. And that there's a lot of people with a lot to fear from this because I think that John Boucher will, I think he'll open a can of rats rather than a can of worms.
Very, very interesting. Anthony, thank you again for, for speaking to me for today's podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.